I said, why? He said, our license plates ends in an even number and they're only giving gasoline for odd numbers today, son. Do you remember America back then? I remember America where we had a president in 79 that wanted to manage the decline of America. Seems kind of similar to the person in office today. I also remember how I felt as an American when I looked around the world. Think for a moment. When was the last time you watched Americans being held hostage? 1979 in Iran, and today four Americans are held hostage there today. When was the last time a U.S. ambassador was killed on foreign soil? That's a direct reflection of the respect but the fear that other countries have of us. It was in Afghanistan in 79 in Stevens in Libya. When was the last time we watched the Soviet Union invade another country and felt our response was somewhat weak? Into Afghanistan, and today Russia has invaded Crimea, Ukraine, and now entered Syria. And do you really think that's about going after ISIS or more to try to control the price of oil? When was the last time as Americans, we had the discussion about the malaise of this country. Remember, Jimmy Carter said, put a sweater on, turn the heater down, but the best days were against us. If you look at the unemployment number, yes, the unemployment number is low, but there's two ways to lower unemployment. Either you put people to work or they give up looking. Do you realize more than 94 million Americans have given up looking? And if you give up looking, you give up on your hopes and your dreams, and you think tomorrow will not be as bright as today. So you want to look at the participation rate. The participation rate in America today is 62.7%. The lowest participation rate since 1978. So what is the answer to this malaise that we had in the late 70s and the malaise we have today? I actually look to people who've been leaders in this country and wonder what advice they would give. Many of you have visited me here or visited me in Washington. If you come into my office, you'll know I have this artwork. This is what I want to talk about today. I have three pieces of art in my office and they all have purpose and meaning. And if you walk into my conference room, there's a great big painting, eight feet by 16. And it's Washington crossing the Delaware. You've all seen that original picture, right? Washington standing up in the rowboat and they're going across. This action took place Christmas 1776. We crossed the Delaware, we surprised the Hessians, and it was our very first victory as a country. Now the original painting hangs in New York, but the artist was not there that night to actually see what was happening, but he depicted in his own mind what he thought it looked like, and he painted it in 1850. He was an immigrant from Germany and had lived in America for 10 years. I want you to look at the painting, because in the painting there are 13 people. Why would the artist pick 13? 13 colonies, right? But he only shows 12 faces. He has Washington standing up in the rowboat like this. We know Washington wasn't standing up in a rowboat, right, on Christmas in the night. But he wanted to pick Washington. You look at like this, this man has never lost a battle. He had not won one yet. But if you look at the people who are in the boat, the second person is wearing a beret. He's Scottish. The person right across from him in the green jacket is African American. You go down the boat in the red is a woman in the very back is a Native American. Now they probably weren't in the boat that day. But he depicted America as a melting pot that everybody was in the boat together. And you know what else? Everybody was rowing in the same direction. They were stronger for it. Now, if you go to the very back, there's a picture of a farmer. And that farmer has the hand of the 13th person you do not see. And what the artist was depicting, here's America risking everything for freedom and liberty for you, having never won before. Here's a hand Will you get in the boat and join them? That's the question I have to you. We are a very strong country when we row together. 
We need to all get in the boat together to make sure we have liberty and freedom for the next generation. Now, I have two other paintings in my office, one of Abraham Lincoln and one of Ronald Reagan. I think they were great leaders. Lincoln's in black and white because of the time of where he served in the country, and Reagan's all in color. And there's times I'm late at night, I'm in the office, and I wonder, what would these two leaders tell us as Americans and give us advice today? Because I think their challenges were actually bigger than what we have. And you know what Lincoln would tell us? He would say, believe in the exceptionalism of this country. That we are different than any other country on earth. The reason why I said Lincoln believed that is the Gettysburg Address. You know, Lincoln wasn't the, the main speaker. He spoke less than 270 words. You all know the first lines four score and seven years ago. But have you ever listened to the other words? Our forefathers brought forth a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated the proposition that all men are created equal. He goes on to say, but if we fail, government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from earth. We were not the world power. He did not say if we fail, don't worry, England or France will pick up the torch because they were not conceived in liberty. They do not believe that everyone is equal. You know when that hit home to me the most? I was in the rotunda one day and Shimon Perez was there. It was in his last year of being president of Israel. He was 92 years old. Think about what he has seen in his lifetime. His own country wasn't created until 1948. And he saw the fights and the wars to be able to keep it. But he stands before us, not as an American. We were giving him a congressional medal. And he looked out and he says, you live in the greatest nation that's ever been on the face of the earth. Not the greatest nation of our time, but on earth. And he says, you know what your greatness comes from? Not what America takes, but what America gives that you'll give the ultimate sacrifice of life so another country could have freedom. And with that freedom becomes human rights and a stronger economy. That is who we are and that is why we must lead. We are different and we should not be ashamed for it. We should take pride in it. The other advice. <laughs> the other advice Lincoln would tell you is don't blame others for your problems. Accept where you are and find a solution. That's your industry. You've got a lot of reasons to complain because other people are making your life tougher. Maybe it be the Middle East, maybe it be the government, but you still survive and come back stronger. You know, Lincoln got elected November 1860, but not sworn in until March 1861. In that short amount of time, seven states left the Union. With technology today, you can scan every word Lincoln has spoken. And never once did he blame Buchanan. He accepted where he was and he found a solution. The other advice Lincoln would tell you is, don't put off tough decisions for a future generation. They may be politically rough, but you have to make them. The debate of slavery didn't start in 1850. It started in the creation of our country. But our forefathers thought it was too divisive, so what did they say? Let's put it off for a future generation. By doing so, they actually made a decision that hundreds of their grandchildren were gonna to die to make that decision. Now, we don't have the same difficult decision, but we have a challenge in which direction we want our country to go, the amount of debt, where entitlements are happening. Are we gonna unleash and unshackle the free market of this country? We should not be shy, we should not be afraid, and we should be willing to risk our own elective jobs to do it. The decision I made last Thursday, I was taking the advice of Lincoln. I did not want to walk onto the floor to be speaker with 218 votes or a few people dictating what I can and cannot do. I will put this country before my own ambition on any day. And our jobs are too big to think that I just want it for myself. I want this country to succeed, and that's why I made the decision that I did. The 
last two. If you look at Reagan's picture, he's in color and he's smiling. We don't have to be angry. Reagan was a happy, optimistic conservative. Why? Because he knew his policies brought people more freedom, more economic growth, the ability to get out and make wealth on their own. And you know what? He had it more difficult than we had today. He had a tax code that was much higher. He had a government that was much more impressive. But he still smiled and brought more people to believe in the idea. And he let everybody in. The last bit of advice Reagan would give us, that he understood peace without freedom is meaningless. Peace without freedom is meaningless. There's so many times in our history that people crave peace, but they forget the idea of freedom. We watched that before World War II with Chamberlain. We have peace in our time. No, we did not. I watched in the latest agreement with Iran the idea of peace, but there was not freedom. So they will go around and fund terrorism continually. And this is what I mean by what Reagan meant. In his last term, he sat down with Gorbachev and ISIS. He was trying to end the missiles, nuclear missile growth. And in this agreement, he almost got everything he wanted. And in the very end, like any negotiation, you always ask for something much greater to see who wants it more. So Gorbachev asked for one item. He said, I want, he wants America to end the SDI program. Reagan said no, but he told him, I'll do something different. I'll share the technology with you so we all can be free. Gorbachev said no. So Reagan had to make a decision. Should he take what he had or should he walk away? Reagan got up and walked away. People criticized him, said he was wrong, said he just missed out on winning the Nobel Peace Prize because he walked away. Had Reagan not walked away, would the Berlin Wall have collapsed? Would the Soviet Union have collapsed? Because he understood peace without freedom is meaningless. So when this president goes to Paris and he wants to sit down and have a climate agreement, I hope he remembers about the freedom. And with freedom means economic growth. And if America cannot have an economic growth, we cannot have freedom, we cannot be strong, and we will harm ourselves around the world. I've watched and talked about 1979. And people wonder, can this country change? In 79, we were being held hostage. We had the Soviet Union growth, and in less than one decade, the hostages came back after one election, the Berlin Wall collapsed, and two years later, the Soviet Union, and we had our strongest economic growth as a country. I still believe the best times are in front of us. I still believe this is the best place to be for the next century. I still believe we have to have a national energy policy that makes us energy independent if we want to control our own future. It will make us economically strong. It will make our foreign policy strong and it will make this next century's ours. So I don't look to Washington to make that solution, I look to this room. When I look to this room, I know the answer. We will do it. I thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Congressman McCarthy. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the members of an expert panel who are going to come up on stage and discuss the subject of innovation in powering California. First, let me introduce the public affairs manager of the Southern Gas Company. Now, as you all know, SoCal Gas is based in Los Angeles. It's the nation's largest gas distribution company. It serves 21 million customers and employs about 8,000 people. 
Public Affairs Manager is Rob Duco. Please welcome him. Next, I'd like to welcome the CEO and President of ERA Energy, which is one of the silver sponsors for this year's event here. ERA, as you all know, is one of the largest California and U.S. oil producers, with annual revenues exceeding $5 billion. Please welcome Christina Sistrom. Our third panelist is Executive Vice President of the California Resources Corporation, one of our silver sponsors also. Uh, he is Executive Vice President of Northern Operations. His name is Bob Barnes. Now, just a, a little housekeeping note. If some of you are wondering whether you got Good, good enough tables, I would like you all to know that this lectern is directly under the drip line. So if you see my suit start to shine, you, if you were up here, you would see the water trail right across the stage. Now to moderate the debate, the man uh, who gave such a compelling talk just a few moments ago, Kevin McCarthy. hitting you as you stand here. I didn't know I'd be welcomed back so soon. So, And I know we've had a little change in panel. I hope everybody drove out careful and uh, we all pray for rain. We just don't want it all in one hour. Um, it's just amazing that uh, people are safe with come out from yesterday. The challenges within this industry, and the challenges that I see are not just on a national level, but actually in the state of what we serve in California, make it a little more difficult. So the first question I, I want all of you to answer, I mean, I look at what others tried to challenge of going after the industry about trying to, the prediction of peak oil, meaning that we hit our cap, we can't go further, so we gotta go to a whole new, another form of industry, or energy. Well, that was proven wrong with the ingenuity of this industry. So now it seems like they want to do a regulatory peak oil through government and the challenges that we see. So my first question is, what do you see for this industry for the next decade through your lens and through your um, industry itself? And I don't know if you want to start with Bob. I see a growing industry. I see an industry that's uh, based on technology and the uh, ingenuity of the people that work for it. I think that we'll see supply and demand dictate our price, but with this, I think we'll, a low oil price should stimulate and, um, a growing economy, and I also believe that the uh, low gas price should stimulate our manufacturing. Christina, what do you see 10 years from now for ERA? 10 years from now for ERA, well, I see us as uh, being a sustainable company that's contributing to the economy in California, but to put it in reference, um, you know, we've got the opportunity to actually craft a practical plan for the energy transition that uh, preserves the health of the state economy, and I think that's important not just to the state, but to the country. And in doing that, you know, we need to put that in context just a little bit. So oil and gas became the primary source of energy in 1960 and supplanted coal at that time. And yet, since that time, coal usage on a global basis has tripled. And so these energy transitions tend to not happen quickly. And I think the oil and gas industry is gonna to continue to have a very important role to responsibly deliver affordable energy for you know, the foreseeable future. And it's a matter of how we do that practically in, a, in an environmentally responsible way in a way that makes sure that we can maintain a robust economy in the state. I think we've got an important role to play in that. Rob? We see uh, natural gas being a, a major, continuing to be a major part of the energy, energy solution 10 years from now and in the long-term future. Um, 
as regulations um, try to drive fossil fuels out, as they, they seem to be doing in, in California, uh, there's not really the realization of the, of the value that fossil fuels bring to our everyday lives. And um, as uh, airborne, um, airboards try to electrify things, um, natural gas produces more than half of the electricity in California today, and will continue to even as more renewables are brought online. And with new technologies in natural gas, um, even with the regulatory peak that, that you referred to, uh, we see natural gas and the other and oil uh, continuing to be major parts of our economic engine in Kern County and California going forward for the long term. So let's raise this question. You're all sitting there in key positions. You can't predict what the future holds. What do you fear the most? What keeps you up at night, or what is the, the biggest short-term and long-term challenge that you see? And maybe I can start with Christina. Christina's new to the community, but she picks the best place. She actually moved next door to my mother. <laughs> so, um, and, and my mo mother thinks she's wonderful because my mother says, you know, I bring her trash can back every week. She's very nice. <laughs> uh, short-term and long-term. In our business, um, that, that's a, a very challenging question. I, I will say, in terms of immediacy, um, every day I work really hard and our organization works really hard to make sure that uh, every person in our operations goes home alive and well every day. And that's gotta be at the forefront of everything that we do. In addition to that, I think as an industry, and I know within ERA, we continue to challenge ourselves to figure out how we can do that with a smaller and smaller footprint in a more responsible way. We're making huge progress there. Um, I do think in the, in the longer term, um, and in the role that I've taken here with ERA, I'm really um, concerned that we don't yet have the right voices at the table grappling with the, this very significant issue around the energy transition. Because if we create plans, um, create policy um, that isn't well thought out and doesn't think about the ramifications, the consequences to, to everyday, everyone's lifestyle and to the economy as a whole could really be devastating. And, and so that's a longer term issue. I don't think that that's a, something that we're you know, going to have to uh, get completely right in the next six months, per se, but it is, it definitely weighs on my mind, and I think the consequences for such a large uh, part of the population mean it's a great responsibility and we need to get it right. I think for the, the long term, our challenge is um, keeping natural gas as part of the energy solution, as it has been. Um, most of the people in this room probably heat their homes with natural gas, heat their hot water with natural gas, cook with natural gas, and there are regulators in California who want to electrify everything. Um, and there are new natural gas technologies which provide near zero or zero emission, um, zero emissions, or what we call power plant level emissions, because electricity is not emission free, it's just the emissions are at the power plant, not at the source of ignition. And so whether it's in home heating, home water heating, um, or even transportation, uh, natural gas can be as clean as the electricity that some of the regulators want to bring in. And toward that end, we've made, um, we've invested strongly in research for uh, heavy duty trucks that run on natural gas. Now, yes, that displaces oil and we're in an oil summit, but we're, dis we're displacing foreign oil. We're not displacing locally produced oil. And so as, to reach some of California's clean air goals. Natural gas is part of that solution, and we see that going forward, but the struggle is to, for the regulators to see natural gas as valuable as what they think electricity is. Well, I too share the, uh, the nightmare of hurting people in our industry. You know, it's the thing that we have to be uh, very conscious of. Uh, nothing we do is worth hurting anybody. One safety standard that we use is uh, one time on the rig, uh, a guy asked me, uh, would you let your child work on this rig? 
Well, every day people send their children to work with us, and they need to go back home safe and sound, just like the shape they showed up. The other thing I worry about a lot is uh, regulation by emotion. You know, it's uh, it's not a scientific debate. You know, I've, I've never worked, I've been around a little while, and um, I've never worked with people that said, let's go screw something up today. Let's pollute something. I think our industry has a track record of doing of a, a stellar performance. We can always be better. I think it's something we always continue to work at. Other thing is we have to have a portfolio of uh, diverse energy sources. It's, it's not just one. I think it's going to take all of us, and that'll give us all the forms of energy. Gas, oil, even uh, the renewables have a place in the future, but I don't think we're there yet. Hey, can I follow just specifically on yours, because we thank you for being here, and Todd Stevens, CEO, graduated BHS, went to the academy, he was very proud, once again, always good. Because of the slide, he couldn't be here. But your company is new and unique. But in essence, your company split and just put all California resources into one. Is that because of the challenge of doing business in California that you had to split entirely? Or what's really the background to that? People, so they understand the challenge of the future of what's going forward. We have a very, very large footprint in California. We're the largest producer. In California. We also uh, are the leading acreage holder. We have over two million acres under lease here. One of the things that we had in being a part of Oxy, and uh, I'm very proud to work for Oxy and, and come from Oxy, is that we always had options. We always had other places to go. And the only way we were ever going to get serious about California is to form off and, if you would, burn the ships. We're going to make it go. And our team that we have here, there's 1,300 of us based here in, in uh, Bakersfield and Taft area, uh, are very committed to make it go. We believe in the potential of the California assets, and this is where we want to be, and we think it's going to be successful for our company and good for the state. So you even think by making it more a micro approach, you could focus more on California, have greater potential, and greater outcome for the long term? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you look at California, right now we're importing about over 50% of our oil, 80% of our gas. You know, uh, energy reliability uh, gives you options. You're not dependent on anybody else. And that's where our country has to be too. We don't need to be dependent on anybody else. So let me ask this question. As I started my talk earlier, yeah, two years ago the price was at 100. We all know when the price is 100, you can have you can do things that you normally can't do. You can uh, spend a great deal on research and development and others. How has the price dropped made you focus, but may have made you stronger for the long run? And what are those investments that you're making now that you think they'll make you stronger later? I'll defer to my oil friends okay. here. Because it doesn't affect we, we don't much. explore. We, we buy the gas that they produce for us. All right. So, uh, interestingly enough, ERA was formed in the late 1990s, um, in a time of relatively low oil prices. And one of the foundational uh, ways of running business that was embraced with the formation of the company was actually to employ lean concepts. So the way Toyota manufactures cars um, is, is the way that ERA aspires to produce oil and gas. And you think there isn't much analogy between those things. But our entire culture has been based on figuring out how to see waste and how to improve our processes day in and day out. And so, you know, this really is a time, um, I believe, where our organization shines because of that approach, that history, and how deeply it's embedded in our culture. Now, in $100 oil prices, you change your uh, processes a bit to focus on volume, and, and there are some things that you can afford to do in that environment that, that you can't when prices are where they are today. But it's part of our DNA to go back in, dust off um, our history, and to figure out actually how to improve the, both the efficiency and the effectiveness of our processes in this time period 
so that we can be stronger when we come out on the other side. Our uh, push very much is on the efficiency. I mean, if you think about it, why would you operate different at a $100 oil than you would $20 oil? You know, the waste, your efficiency, stuff, that, you shouldn't give that up just because you have a higher oil price. I had an old boss one time said to me, uh, why don't you just burn it out in the parking lot and be just as effective? You know, we get very, very wasteful at $100 oil. I think these are things in the past that we have to learn from. Our investment in technology, that's just do more with less. And uh, I think that's what our future is. Technology and uh, uh, a growing uh, educated workforce. You bring up workforce, and uh, that's what we're very interested in. That's what TAP College is interested in. We know the value of energy, and we know the ever-changing from innovation and the different expectations you have of the workforce. Maybe you can talk to us about what does the future workforce look like, what are your needs, and what are things that we can do as a community to make sure we're meeting those needs uh, for your workforce in the future. Our workforce, like many, I think, like many workforces, is aging. Um, in the next five years, more than 50% of our employees are eligible for retirement. That's been the same figure for many years. Not everyone's retiring, but a lot of them are and a lot of them will be. It's the, the baby boom generation as, as they age out of the workforce. And so you're looking at 4,000 out of the 8,000 employees that, that could leave in the next five years, and that's a lot of experience, a lot of brain drain. So what we need is um, capable, experienced people at all levels, from the entry level um, laborer, ditch digger, all the way up to executives who can enter into our company with, with skills appropriate for the jobs uh, to which they're, they're assigned. And we need them trained by our high schools, by our colleges. And that's part of the reason here locally, um, SoCal Gas is part of the Taft College uh, Petroleum Partners. We've, their companies are too. We're involved in the in the energy technology program here at Taft College. We're involved in the Energy and Utility Academy at Independence High School in Bakersfield. And so those types of, of involvements are are what we're doing to help train our, our upcoming workforce that will be working for us 10 years from now, 20 years from now. I think for us, um, you know, as we look forward, we've got similar demographic challenges and, and we've brought an awful lot of new people business, particularly over the last five years, but the, the general themes are, you know, as our business becomes more challenging and the external expectations around performance go up, we really need to have people that are committed to working in a safe manner and are very committed to uh, delivering the best environmental performance possible every day. So no shortcuts, no, know your role, play your role, do it right every day. And the third item really is that our business is becoming uh, more and more complex. And the challenges of extracting more mature oil uh, is, is definitely pushing us. We need people that have the fundamental uh, data analysis skills and the, the science and math background in particular to, to keep getting better year on year. And so uh, emphasizing the, the science and math background, uh, not just in engineering, geosciences, but even in operations, um, is becoming uh, increasingly an expectation for our business. People think of our business as, as not very technically challenging. I'd say if they believe that, they've never actually been to one of our facilities or look, looked at what it takes to run our business day in and day out. It's a pretty exciting business from a, from a technical standpoint. You know, I agree. The, uh you know, the hammer in the 36 has been replaced by a laptop and a tablet. It's, uh, as we change our, uh, as our workforce, the great crew change out does occur, you know, the, we're uh, seeing a new set of skill sets uh, introduced into our industry. And I think that's one of the things that uh, uh, our uh, workforce and the way we approach our work will change. You know, gone are the days where they threw you a Halliburton book in a company and uh, keys to a company car and say, go get them. We have the mentoring. We're actually, you know, uh, even through Taft College and through the, the programs here, we're growing the workforce for what we need. And I think that'll pay out dividends in the future, especially as a great crew change out the I, I think you hit on a key, though, that 
Every company today is a technology company, whether you think it is or not. And your greatest strength is innovation. Your partnership is what you've had. But in this time, is there, is there something we should look to to adapt? Is there, is there a model where we should actually grab some people who work for you to help educate our students now too, to focus on that math and science, to hone in more with on the industry? Is, is there some partnership there that we are not looking at that we should take this moment in time to be more creative to do so you don't have to look further away from Kern County to find those employees? Is that something that's of an interest? I think innovative things like that are always useful. Um, educate the, the best training is the training you get on the job, and anyone who comes to work for us or probably these the oil companies as well gets trained in our specific processes. But they need to have that basic education. Our our entry level, um, I don't know the exact title for them, but the laborers, the ones who dig ditches and, and lay pipe, need to have an 11th or 12th grade math education because it's a technical job to 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 deal with how deep you're setting the pipe and the pressures and everything else that, that goes into it. So you can't just drop out of high school at 14 or 16 and, and get a job laying pipe for us. It's not possible. You, need, you do need an education, a, a, a background, some, some base, basis uh, to, to know how to do it, what you need to do for us. But whenever we can have a hands-on experience, an intern, or uh, a, a day at the office, or, you know, bring in students for, for a day to to see what we do, that there's That's always value in that. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, you know, I think the the idea of uh, contributing to education is something Era has been very involved with. I mean, everything from, um, you know, I think we're, we're one of the original and continue to be a sponsor for a program like Ready to Start. So actually G focus Gene on invested early in that. Yeah, yeah you know, you. preschool learning and, and preschool readiness. You know, through um, we, we have many of our employees actively out in the community um, in active mentoring programs, particularly at the high school level. And we've got uh, a relationship with most of the learning institutions in Kern County, I believe, because we do believe that that is such a critical issue. Are there opportunities to do more? I suspect that there are, um, and, and we certainly would be interested in learning how we can be more effective in partnering in that area I would say of all the community work that, that ERA does, the commitment to advancing education, particularly as a way of life, uh, for the opportunity it creates for people to create a new future for themselves, is probably the single biggest commitment we have in trying to give back to the community. So it is always an issue that is uh, very front of mind for us. We kind of approach it on uh, two or three different levels. First, we sponsor uh, several schools around the the county, uh, if they need something, we go in there and try to uh, accommodate what they need. And, uh, it's within our means. Our uh, people, we've changed our policy from uh, the mentoring and the different programs. I know uh, Mr. Holmes is uh, very good about uh, uh, getting mentors and uh, the people that we need. We uh, gone are the days from that's a great deal. Go do it on your own time. To now we make time during the day to get it. We have an intern program where we let uh, get students from the various programs uh, job shadow, if not uh, summer employment. And then finally, uh, with our employees, uh, we uh, strongly can, uh, encourage the continuing education uh, up to uh, reimbursement for the money they spend and uh, uh, strongly encourage further development. <laughs> I've got a couple more questions, but I want you to thank us some because we want this to be your event. So think it back in your mind, if you ever had these individuals up here, you know the industry that you're a part of, what is the burning question you want to know as well? You know, in one of my talks I talked about natural gas and protecting the environment. A lot of people think those are mutually exclusive. I, I disagree. I think we have proven that here. Um, I know we're in California, we had the Division of Oil and gas, Dogger. There were a couple years ago when uh, the governor first came in and he was changing the direction of that. And there were many nights he and I would just talk on the phone. It was interesting, he, he had a certain opinion and 
and I would make an argument back the other way. And to his credit, he reversed his opinion once we provided him with information. But it almost seems, and I talk to him every now and then as well, it almost seems like that's reversed back. And they have so much control over this industry. You need common sense, but I'm not opposed to regulation. I just don't want it changed every day. Tell me what it is and we'll meet it. And just make it based upon science. Um, you're in the forefront of this. That has probably more to do about the future of Kern County when it comes to energy, of where we're going. What is your perspective of solving that or where are we currently where are we currently in this um, conversation with them, and where do you see the outcome going? Anybody can pick at the beginning, and don't get yourself in trouble, or you can blame it all on me. <laughs> we've, uh, we've been very active with the governor, in, uh, both on our company uh, advocacy and through the uh, trade groups, CIPA, WISPA, uh, IOPA. These are things that uh, we want to try to uh, you know, on the regulation point, again, it's it's not a regulation by emotion. You know, let's, let's have at least equal footing, the science and the, the emotion. Uh, I think we asked for our day in court, if we can listen to them, show the safeguards of the industry, show our processes, show what the, uh, the outcomes are. I uh, believe we can uh, work, meet their, the fears that they have, show the engineering controls are there, the administrative controls we need, and accomplish uh, both the, the flexibility you, we need. Do you think we could do this without going to court? I think we better do it without going to court. Okay, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. So, um, as you mentioned, I'm very new in this community. I'm very new in California. Um, and I mentioned that ERA has a, a long history of, of lean. And so we fundamentally believe not only the most efficient, but the most effective way to run our, our operation is to have the people that know the work best at the table solving the problems on how to improve. And I can think of a couple recent examples that I've seen just since I've been here where it appears that the legislature is actually trying to write regulation, not just set law. And in the course of doing that, um, there isn't much engagement proactive engagement with the industry to understand how those goals could be perhaps best and most efficiently achieved. And so after the fact, when the legislation gets passed or you're in the process of, of arguing with a uh, specific regulation as it's been written or proposed, um, you never get to the same level of efficiency and effectiveness. Right? So, so you're trying to mitigate things that may be the worst clauses in that regulation and find a workable path forward. So, you know, I think we can do better. I think we need to do better. Um, I think it's critically important to find a way um, to, to navigate this energy transition that preserves the health of the economy. And to do that, I think we've got to have everybody at the table um, and, and actually have an objective analysis of how to find that common ground and move forward in the best way. Uh, that's going to take a lot more dialogue than we've currently got going on. I believe it's possible, I believe it's critical, but it's a different path than the one we're on today. I know it doesn't really affect you, so i got a special question. <laughs> um, we watched across the country, the states, including California, creating these mandates to increase the adoption of renewables for uh, electricity generation. I want to be realistic about it. We've always talked about all the above. But I hear so much from others about we should switch to 100%. Is that realistic? And what, what would the effects have on the economy? Right now, it's not realistic. Half, today, 52% of California's electricity is, is generated by natural gas fired power plants. There's a few here in Kern County, here in the, the western part of the, part of the county. As one of the, the realities of renewables, so to speak, is that as more solar and wind ele generated electricity comes online, more natural gas power plants are needed to back up the intermittency of the wind and solar. Our um, 
peak demands are changing now to times when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining when it's expected to. And more natural gas is going toward power plants than would normally um, would normally happen. We like to say uh, gas, natural gas puts the able in renewable. Without natural gas, the renewables wouldn't be possible. Um, so until there's battery storage of some sort, which technology is working on, or some other means of, of storing energy, specifically electrical energy, there will not be 100% renewable electrical energy unless you only want your lights on when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. And, you know, fossil fuels have helped our, our forefathers saw the, the value of fossil fuels in, in providing light at night and everything that we enjoy today, including the light shining on us now. Um, so no, it's, right now it's not possible. What would the cost be? Are, as we oh, push more of these mandates, do the costs go up or the costs go down to the oh, co costs would go up. You'd, you'd be looking at retrofitting everyone's home heating system, everyone's hot water heating system, everyone's stove, everyone's dryer to run on electricity. That, that's the first thing. And then the um, natural gas is not just clean burning, the cleanest burning fossil fuel, but it's the least expensive right now than coal, and coal's been legislative, uh, legislated out of use in our state already. And so yeah, the cost would go up to the general public. 30% of our customers are already getting financial assistance on their bill. And that number would just- 30% of your customers? 30% of our customers. Have you thought of some questions? Anybody have their hand up? I'm gonna keep going if you don't. All right. This is a personal one. We always hear, and there was such great potential for the Monterey ship. Is there any insight uh, anybody can give me into where we think the future goes, especially with technology? I mean, maybe it's not right around the corner, but the plays within there, and what do we think can happen? We have uh, 50,000 barrels a day coming. Look closer. Sorry? Look closer. Okay. We have 50,000 barrels a day coming from the uh, upper Monterey. So we're, uh, we're pretty excited to, to get after the rest of the Monterey, the lower Monterey uh, production. We hold two million acres of potential there. Um, as the price allows, uh, we can't wait to get started to, to exploit it. We believe in the Monterey. And you think you've figured the technology out for it? No, it, the shell technologies, you look at the technologies that are employed today in California and throughout the, the rest of the shell plays around. I mean, I think we have it. I think it's going to be, uh, there's going to be some trial and error to match the technology to the challenge. But uh, yes, I think it's there. Okay. Any insight? So we have a, a group that looks at not only the Monterey, but a, a wider variety of opportunities that we see. And we are encouraged that with the latest generation of seismic technology, we can see things we haven't seen before. But um, you know, we're going to have to test those with the drill bit. At, at this point in time, we'll tell you we haven't had the level of success that, that we want to have to, to, to say that's going to be a breakthrough. But we're continuing to work it, and uh, as the technology matures and we can prove it, um, we're committed to moving forward uh, to developing those resources. It doesn't apply to you. I'll, I'll say we're excited about all the shale <laughs> gas coming into, into our system and across the country. You know, the other thing about innovation, and I know we're talking about oil and natural gas, and I, I know, despite what's dripping on me right now, we are in a severe drought. <laughs> and um, I think I need an umbrella up here. And it's just one side. But, um, you know, there's a big talk about El Nino, and even if El Nino comes, does not mean we're out of our problem. You need three years of it, and do we have the storage for it? And I know we're an agriculture and we're an energy community. And I never want to see people battle together, but you are doing some innovative help when it comes to the drought and water. And I don't think people have really seen that or that we haven't got all the potential there yet. But I see the oil industry as a way to work with the ag industry that we could have a bridge here when it comes to water. And maybe we can touch a little on that if you can, in the approach of what you have been doing, or what you think we should be doing. Uh, what a tremendous resource, the produced water we have. 
course, the first thing we want to do with it is to put it back into the reservoir, maintain our pressure, you know, flood the, the well towards our producers. But on the water, the, the quality that we can export to agriculture, we export more water to ag today than we do in our freshwater footprint. We are actively looking at processing several... Oh, say, say that again, you, look you, you support more water to agriculture today. That's right. We, we furnish more water to agriculture than the fresh water we use throughout our entire operation. Than the fresh water they use. We are looking at several different technologies and different uh, produced water qualities to find how do we match it to get a, a, a sustainable quality for agriculture and for uh, repurposing this water. So it's something we're very active in. It's too big a resource not to exploit, and uh, we fully support it. We might become a water company. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, our focus on water stewardship is not new for us. So every year we set five key priorities in our business for the business plan. And water stewardship has been one of our five priorities uh, for the last two years, and I can tell you it will continue to be that in 16. And that looks like a variety of things. So if you've ever driven by Arrow's office in Bakersfield, it, you're going to see we don't have any green grass. And that actually is part of a planned effort to minimize water at that office facility. And in the last year, by changing how we keep the trees alive, choosing not to plant seasonal flowers and uh, really aggressively managing the water at that facility. Uh, just in last year, we saved 10 million gallons of water. Um, in 2008, when that facility was uh, revitalized, we put in all uh, low water usage uh, uh, toilets and sinks throughout the facility. And since then, we've saved about a million and a half gallons just from that effort. Um, our employees are really on this, and they help us find new ways to use water more wisely and to use less of it. When we look at our operating areas, um, you know, in our, in our Ventura facility, 96% of the water that we use is recycled from our produced water. Our Bell Ridge facility, which is our largest operation, 90% of the water we use um, is actually recycled from our produced water. Um, we have some characteristics in the water that we produce that we have not broken the technology key to be able to uh, give it for beneficial use to ag. Um, but, but in the next year, we'll be starting a pilot plant to try and uh, uh, look at what that next, break, next breakthrough is in technology so that we could aspire to be able to do that and do it in a way that uh, is affordable. So even in this time when money is tight for us, and I know people sometimes are skeptical that, that oil companies do, do have budgets like everybody else, but we do, uh, we're continuing to fund that research because we think it's so critical to the community that we operate in. Through our energy efficiency efforts with businesses and, and residences, um, low flow shower heads, uh, um, faucet aerators that help reduce the use of water and therefore the use of natural gas to heat the water. Um, what we've done over the years is saving 414 million gallons of water this year from what we've done in past years. And at our facilities, we've cut our water usage by 25% since, since 2007, and that's equal to 26 million gallons of water this year. So Thank similar you. efforts. Yeah. I do be believe in re reserving, um, finding ways to be more efficient with water, but I still do believe in California. You know, we talk about desalinization plants, and I spend a lot of money to make salt water fresh water. My talk on the floor of the House of Representatives was, before we do that, we should make sure our fresh water doesn't go out and be salt water. <laughs> so, I like having a green grass. I like having flowers. I don't like the idea of California being brown. And you know what? If we had storage, we'd have a lot more water, so uh, I do appreciate the work you're doing. Let me check to see if there's any burning questions. Yes, speak loud and I'll repeat it. Okay, that's it. Say that a little louder. It was labor. Union labor is being required to work on CRC properties. 
I want to address that. Well, we are uh, we are employing uh, union labor. We're using the trades mainly for their quality and for the uh, the uh, political power that they bring with them. You know, we look for a, a long partnership in this type of uh, labor arrangement. It's not exclusive. It's uh, for our maintenance. And it's for our surf, or for our location construction and for our uh, facility constructions. The drilling operations are not. But uh, we look forward to working with the crafts and trades. We believe they bring a, a qualified uh, a qualified workforce to our um, industry, and it's the technology we're looking for. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Shut down lines in Santa Barbara Beach, shut down how big of impact and fracking. Fracking from an environmental point? Yeah. I don't know if any of you are in Santa Barbara County. We're not affected. Not we, we, do, we do have operations there. Um, I would say, you know, on the issue of fracking, which is let me call it hydraulic fracturing yeah. of the reservoir. Um, that has lowered methane a great deal. Yeah. So, um, you know, people treat this like this is a new issue. And, and I think what I want to draw people's attention to is that actually um, we can use our Bell Ridge field as an example where we've been doing hydraulic fracturing at Bell Ridge for, for five decades. Think about that. I mean, we have a lot of data that says that this can be done responsibly, it's effective, um, and it can be managed. Um, we have been under a spotlight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you if there were credible data out there to say that this is not a practice that's being done in a responsible manner, it would have been found. Um, I, I am very, very confident of that. Um, and so, you know, I think it does continue to generate a lot of controversy. Um, often in the conversation, um, the, the conversation can be very emotional, but when you look at the science, um, there is a clear path forward that this, this can be done in a very environmentally responsible way. And in fact, you know, the vast majority of the work being done is, is being done to those standards. And it is an important technology if we're going to have a, a, a forward uh, future that provides affordable energy as we try and, and move more towards renewables. So it, it really is a key enabling technology. All right, I'm going to end with this question because I want to go outside to get out of the rain. <laughs> <laughs> got to get out from under this tent. You all do an amazing work on so many different parts. But the, one of the greatest qualities, I think, of our community is that we always give back. And there's so many nonprofits, so many times we don't look to government to solve the problems. It's people in this room. But we would never be able to be so successful without your company. So I want you to just take a moment and give that other side of, of a few things that I know so many that your companies and your employees donate their time, donate their effort, donate their money. I want to give that window to you right now um, to highlight to everybody else some of those priorities that you've done. Start with you. I don't know the exact numbers, but somewhere between one and two million dollars, I believe it is, that we donate directly to um, not-for-profit organizations throughout the 12 counties we serve in Southern California, from Fresno to Fresno County to the Mexican border. Um, here in Kern County, Taft College Foundation, Boys and Girls Club, uh, CASA of Kern County are some of our our large, larger recipients. Uh, we encourage our employees to volunteer and we, we donate to the groups to which they volunteer their time to encourage that volunteerism. Um, it, I don't know the number of how many thousands of hours have been donated by our employees uh, each year. Uh, so yes, as, as you said, we're 
for 140 years we've been involved in the communities that we that we serve and that we live and work in, and, and that continues, and we're proud to do that. So. I don't have the exact budget at the top, top of my head either, but um, we have a, a, a learning academy, we call it ERA Academy, that we recently uh, constructed at our facility in Bakersfield. And on one wall in the academy, we've actually got listed all of the, the organizations that we have contributed to. I promise you there are over 200 names on the list. I, I mean, I, I I'm very proud every time I walk by that wall to know the footprint that ERA has had. If I had to focus on the things that um, I'm most proud of, I will say it really has been multiple efforts that we've got around education. I mentioned that earlier. Um, some of which we've helped fund and start and have continued to support. Some of which we have joined midstream after others with great vision have gotten them started and we've been able to have an influence there. As I came into this role, I actually was surprised because I've connected with several of the medical institutions throughout the communities that, that we operate in. And I've been surprised at what a large footprint ERA has had in being able to donate to improving the medical facilities across the communities. And, 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 and so while surprising, it is certainly something that I'm very supportive of and I'm proud that that's been a part of our history. Those are probably the two that I would highlight. I know you're a new company. <laughs> You know, I believe uh, Americans be the most generous people on earth, and our company, uh, I think it's a great subset of that. We uh, support everything from the local schools through all the uh, charities. Every time there's a disaster, every time we have a fundraising, uh, our employees uh, greatly exceed uh, our expectations in what we do. As a company, our CEO has instructed us, we will not cut back on the uh, charitable donations during the, uh, this downturn, if you would. He said that's when the communities need us the worst, and that's uh, one of the last things he'd ever cut. So, that's what we're I, I think they're all being very humble. There's not one place that I can't drive in this community that I'm going to see their names on it. I go to the era baseball field. There's things they do from early education that they don't tell others, and so. I don't think you all get enough credit for what your employees and what you give back. And I, I want to thank you for that. Now, I just want to give you a, a last statement. You, you can bring up anything we didn't bring up. You can uh, just thank people, but whatever you want to do for a last statement and uh, appreciate the opportunity. To be here. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I don't look like the picture of Dennis Ariel in your program. Uh, he did not make it here today because of the the road closures, um, but I appreciate the opportunity to pinch it for him. SoCal Gas is looking forward to, to an exciting future with some new natural gas technology, some things you'll hear about in the future, uh, power to gas, heavy duty transportation, and, and other aspects of natural gas, clean burning natural gas that'll help uh, clean California's air as the regulators want and use fossil fuels uh, to their fullest to uh, energize our economy. Thank you very much for having me. I do want to tell you how um, privileged I feel to be here. Um, I will say I think this is a, a more uh, supportive gathering than most that we, we, we could put together with these kind of numbers. Um, I've worked in the oil and gas industry for over 30 years. Um, and while I haven't lived on five continents, I actually have done work on five continents in that process. And I will tell you that if I could choose to be anywhere in the world right now, working on this challenge, it would be right here with you. And I have found the people here to be amazing, welcoming, and capable of taking this challenge on, although there are days when it seems daunting. And so I look forward to working with you so we can create that future, not just for ourselves, but for our children and grandchildren. So thank you.
Uh, we, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm sorry uh, Todd couldn't make it again, uh, another uh, victim of the mudslide. But, uh, you know, I did stay at a Holiday Inn Select last night, so <laughs> kind of fun, you know, but, you know, I'm, I'm so, uh, so proud of our company and the, uh, the dedication and uh, the can-do attitude of our employees, the way we've attacked it. Uh, you know, when we were spun off from Oxy, uh, I like to say they took the change in the ashtray. I mean, they took everything. And uh, so uh, we, uh, our company's been, uh, our employees have just pitched in. We're a proud member of this community, and we're here to see uh, our company and California grow. And, you know, one thing, uh, one, one other comment on the, on the energy prices, you know, as, as they try to, uh, push the non-industry agenda by regulation, by higher prices. There's no one that suffers more than the poorer communities throughout our, uh, throughout our county, throughout our uh, state. And I, I think that's just a tragedy. And uh, I think that's one of the things we need to really be cognizant of as an industry is the people that are getting hurt the worst. So thank you. So let's give a round of applause to all of you. We just want you to know we are very grateful of your investment, of your work, of your employees, and uh, this community supports you. Thank you all and God bless. Thank you, Kevin, and our thanks to Rob, Bob, and Christina. That was a very enlightening discussion and they touched on a number of important subjects, some of them controversial, but I was particularly intrigued when they were talking about the workforce of the future, because it occurs to me that if in a few years I take a two-year course here at Taft Community College, then I could enter the workforce in the petroleum industry and replace as an intern, a retiring 60 or 65 year old individual. And if they paid me, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Now, if you look at your schedules, you will have noted that we are running a little bit ahead of time. So, if I may, uh, I'd like to digress for just a moment. I met a number of you last night at the beautiful library at the college. And a few of you were interested, I thought, in trying out for Jeopardy. Uh, it's a lot easier now than it used to be in the past. You can go online to Jeopardy.com. You can take a test online. And if you pass that test, we will then inform you when we will be doing live testing in Los Angeles. And then you come down to that, and you get to sit in a room with about 120 other people, and you take a written test. 50 questions. If you score 35 or better, we keep you in the room and we put you into a mock game competition against other people who have passed the test. And if our contestant coordinators feel you have done well in that mock game, they then sit you down individually, interview you to determine if you have any personality. <laughs> That's very important. If you have no personality, you cannot be a contestant on Jeopardy. You can host it. Well, as uh, we move on, it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce the superintendent.